Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the programme where you can have all of your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. With me today are John Howard, property developer, public speaker and author. Welcome back John. Good to be back. Next to you is Stefano Lucatello, senior partner of Cobalt Law, international lawyer and author. And of course not least, celebrity chef, soon to do another programme I understand. Absolutely Stephen, yes. Welcome Stefano, Hello there. good to have you back. And finally, Thomas Balashev, founder of Montague Property International. Thomas, welcome to you. Thanks. Good to see you back again. You too. John, we're going to start with you. Yes. Your question is this. When one applies for planning permission to undertake a small development project, are there any qualifications that I'd need to show? Are the planners likely to question my experience? No, not at all. Uh, anyone can have a go. Uh, whether you should be... Uh, looking to develop without any experience is another matter. But do what I do, surround yourself with the very best people you can find and make sure they are qualified. Okay, anything extra to that? Not really, you've got to start somewhere. But as I said, just make sure the people around you have got more experience than you have. Really, really important to have experience and do the job properly. Make sure you've got some good indemnity insurance, professional indemnity yeah. insurance. Good lawyer. Stefano, from a legal point of view, what is your responsibility as a developer if you're doing a small project? Well, you've got responsibilities on, envir on the environment, haven't you, John? Health and safety. Health and safety. Environment. environment. I mean, I see all these construction sites. We are, we are a good... A, a considerate, con considerate, considerate developer and builder, Consider contractor. So that's noise. Yeah. And also the dust when you're demolishing. I notice you've got these great big humidifiers that mm. chuck um, spray at the dust so that it, it doesn't go anywhere else. It stays there. Um, protecting your own employees. Yeah, and, 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 and time scale, you know, you can only normally work between eight and eight and five, five days a week, and maybe Saturday mornings if you're lucky. So there's lots of things to consider. But if it's a small scheme and he hasn't got any experience, uh, you know, you've got to start somewhere. Just, but please, please, please take advice and get some people around you that have got experience. OK, Thomas, um, you deal in international real estate. Do you see much difference between UK developers and overseas developers? Things, it's quite generic, but things can be more relaxed overseas. Is that a polite way of saying not, not quite so safe? Uh, it depends who you're doing. If you deal with like a big boy, then it's like you've got absolutely no problem. It's yeah. equally as good as any top development in the UK. Okay. But on like a more regional affair, like in so Cyprus, for example, which I know the area really well, can be a little bit lax, so you need to be really... I wouldn't suggest to start his first time development in an overseas oh. country. W wooden and bamboo scaffolding. Yeah, hard hats, hard <laughs> hats. I mean, in Italy, in Spain, in France, Portugal, they tend to use wooden wooden struts and wooden, yeah. con um, wooden poles yeah. and scaffolding as opposed to metal poles. That's one thing that always strikes me. Well, I, th I, th I think the lesson here is one which comes out time and time again in this programme, get your team right. Absolutely, it's so important. And that in does include the legal team as well. Not just you know the quantity surveyor or the building surveyor and the architect. Well, I think you're Maybe. right, Johnny. It, it starts right from the beginning with your build contract, with your yep, legal side, absolutely. Design. And then at the very end of day, um, your agent is representing you, and and that also needs to you be a professional, a full, slick organisation. Yeah, full. T you really do need a full team. Okay, great. So, Stefano, we're going to move on to you. Your first question is this: The Italian government seems to be struggling along with its economy. I'm considering buying a lakeside property in Italy and wonder how these governance and economic problems may affect me. It's my intention to reside in my new Italian home permanently. Any advice on how I might ring fence my situation and protect myself from any unattractive financial consequences of these difficulties? That's quite a broad question. Good isn't question. It's a very broad question. It's a question that I don't think there is a short answer to. I mean, the Italian government uh, is notorious for um, bringing retrospective legislation into force. So you're in 2019 and they'll say that something has been, in, they'll bring some legislation in and they'll say they'll backdate it to 2017, 2018, mainly on the income tax and the taxation side of things because um, the, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, is, uh, is very short of money. Uh, there's uh, Parliament folds every 18 months. In fact, we've just had a folding of Parliament and a new Prime Minister elected. Uh, and it's not very good for the punter because punters are very frightened of the government. The, it doesn't have the best reputation. That aside, I mean, Italy is one of the best countries I would buy, being Italian. 
Um, I know the, the country back to front, there are fantastic regions north to south. What can you do to, to, to ring fence yourself? Well, you need to make sure that you buy a property which is good to start with. You can't you know, make a, a good property out of something that's very, very bad usually. Make sure you surround yourself with a good team, legal team, mm -hmm. building team, construction team, planning, yeah. surveyor, architects. Although in Italy, um, the architect is the person that does less than the surveyor. The surveyor seems in Italy to take on more, the geometra, mm -hmm. seems to take on more responsibility than the architetto. Um, and make sure that all your planning team and all the team you take on board have indemnity insurance. I mean, I can't stress enough when you do building abroad, and people come to me and they say, can you recommend me a builder in such and such a place or a project manager? We do deal with certain people in certain countries. Uh, and, you know, we only deal with people who have proper indemnity insurance and cover. Because at the end of the day, your, uh, your um, recourse will be against that person. If that person has no money, then you, you know, you're not in a very good position at that point. There's not much you can do in Italy. Just make sure you take the right people with you and you buy and, and you do the right thing, you do the legal due diligence. Now, out, out of the buying process, you've perhaps got a UK lawyer advising you, you've got your perhaps uh, Italian lawyer dealing with the transaction, you've got your notario um, looking after the strict legals, I suppose, putting it, putting it that way. Who, who is the one person that, that, that you can ultimately trust out of all those people? Who's got the... Who's, who's got the real say-so over the paper? Well, the notaio. The notaio, in any civil law jurisdiction, uh, with, in common, uh, as opposed to our common law jurisdiction, you have a notaio in Spain, you have a notario in Portugal, you have a notario in France, you have the notaire. He is the representative of the government, he's there for tax purposes, and he's there to see that the vendor is the vendor, the purchaser is the purchaser, the amount of money that's being paid over is the correct amount of money, or has been paid over if it's in another jurisdiction. Uh, and that the taxation on the vendor side of things when he sells is payable. In many jurisdictions, uh, the notaire or the notario or the, that government figure um, will retain an amount of money uh, for a period of time, during which time he will look into local, regional and national tax for the vendor to see that he doesn't owe anything. And then once he's done that and cleared it, he will send the money back to that person uh, and give him a clearance certificate. So he is the person with the ultimate power. He will say, no, I'm not going ahead with it for whatever reason. He may find something that someone else has not spotted. Tom, uh, just, I mean, running through the sort of Medita Mediterranean countries, I'm thinking in particular, do you find that's a sort of pretty standard process throughout? Yeah, it's a pretty standard process. I mean, my personal experience and the people that we've dealt with has been where they've tried to focus at a slightly larger scale project so whether it's larger builds larger property purchases so they tend to deal with usually larger developers most of the people that we've had experience with have bought new build or off plan so that the size of the developer have been maybe in the top four in the country um, so a lot of these processes and that infrastructure is already done but if someone like that individual there is looking to just buy overseas it sounds like it's a lifestyle decision so I personally wouldn't worry too much about how the economy is going to affect. Yeah. I think if they take enough money there, just enjoy it. I know there's an awful, awful, awful lot of thought goes into whether you should buy a resale property abroad or whether you should buy a new build. I always tend to think that just buying new builds is so much safer because it takes just quite a lot of points out You're of the You're purposely equation. opening a can of worms here, aren't you, Steve? Well, you know, know what's going to, what I'm going to say. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm going to say and you know what he's going to say as well. <laughs> I've learned from him. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, go on, OK. Go on, Thomas, tell us what you think. I, I, I think you have to decide what you want. So if it's an investment property, typically speaking, you can get a little bit more meat on the bone when you buy it off plan and it can increase in value before it's even hit the different phases. So that ticks that box. From a personal point of view, if I would say, for example, Italy, I wouldn't buy a new build. I want to buy something with character because it's a lifestyle decision. So you have to decide what you want first of all, and then that's going to dictate where you buy. All right, Tom, we're going to have to move on to your question now. Um, I have recently looked uh, into buying property, possibly in either Dubai or Spain, for a holiday home. And I've been told it would be sensible to make the purchase in an offshore company. Is there any advice on the pluses and minuses of purchasing this way? That's actually a really popular question. Um, I don't know, it's like someone's advertising for offshore companies at the moment. It seems to be like flavour of the month. There's good and bad sides of it, but one thing that people need to realise is that when it goes in an offshore company, it stays in an offshore company, and whatever you do is in an offshore company, and being a director of any company, there's responsibilities. Now, in Dubai, specifically, if you start setting up companies in Dubai, it can be a very, very tricky situation. Um, not one that I would ever advise anyone to get involved in unless they 
a thoroughly experienced with negotiating company structures and the legislation involved in Dubai. As far as Spain's concerned, I, I wouldn't know that there were too many benefits of buying a property in Spain in an offshore company. I think it used to be many years ago, people used to buy in, uh, in offshore companies set up in Gibraltar. Yeah, and of course, you, you, you could just transfer the property by, by the transferring shares. the bit of paper, couldn't yeah, you? Absolutely. Um, no, I mean, uh, Portugal, Spain brought in heavy taxation of 3% yeah. of the value of the property going up every year mm -hmm. and 5% respectively uh, some 20 years ago nearly now uh, because they saw that lots of people were not paying the taxation they should have been. Very much the same as, as the, the enveloping and the de-enveloping came into effect in 2013 in the United Kingdom when anyone bought a, um, a property through a, an English company or a foreign company for that. It didn't have to be an offshore company. Okay, gents, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. Join us again after the break. Hello and welcome back to Property Question Time. With me are John, Stefano and Tom. Welcome back, gents. John, your question. Is it more difficult to carry out property development in London as opposed to perhaps, say, in the home counties? I'm thinking particularly in respect of work practices, things like hoarding, uh, material storage, etc., and, of course, the building regulations. Well, the building regulations are the same across the UK, but what you have in London, of course, is traffic and congestion and congestion charges, which makes a builder's life or a developer's life very, very difficult. For instance, skips, you know, can you put a skip outside the property? If it's in Ipswich or in Norwich or in Manchester, probably you can. I thought but Ipswich can you was in, a skip. That's very rude. <laughs> Ipswich is, the, I said, it's, it, it's less than an hour from London by train. But... Where was it? <laughs> less than an hour from London <laughs> by train. So... Only teasing. But... In London, you know, if you can get a skip on the site, you'll be lucky. So there's lots of complications, uh, and building um, going up, you, you, you know, you might, you, you know, you might need all sorts of extra protection because of what's around you and people walking around the site and so on. Whereas, you know, in a in a in a, a more smaller town, probably you won't have that issues. So there's lots of extra issues, lots of extra challenges. I mean, uh, the, they mention here hoarding, and just to explain for our viewers, uh, especially in some of the more affluent areas of London, yes. um, Tom, I think where you're based in Mayfair, people have to put hoardings up with very complicated graphic designs mm. that have to be approved in themselves, and sometimes it's almost as difficult to get consent for the hoardings as it, it is for the building yeah, we, that you're going is, to do. Yeah, which is interesting, because you know? outside London, you, you know, we put hoardings up all and the paint time. Paint them green. You paint them <laughs> green, and you, put, and you put an advert on, of, of what you're doing behind it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, there are more challenges, and if, if they're doing a development in London, you probably have got to add on at least another 20, 25%, not just because uh, builders charge more in London, but also because of all the stress and hassle the builders got in terms of getting rid of the rubbish, which is very expensive, what we said, and so on. Getting lorries in between certain times of the day, perhaps at night, and so on. So it is a real challenge. I think what's quite pleasing in London, I mean, the, the, the authorities are quite conscious of, uh, of this difficulty, but I'm glad to see that we're using the river a lot more now. I know. Canary Wharf here have had to use the river to take all their uh, rubbish away. Oh, not to throw it in the river. Not throw it in the river. I, I no. think that, uh, and of and course, build, great, building all the materials in. That's it's great. sustainability for you. There you go, sustainability. But where does it go once it's in the it's in these these up. plants? Definitely, that might be another question. <laughs> you know, we'll have to do a different program. Tom, any comments on this? I, just, I think, based on what you both said, it's just more expensive. Yes. Typically speaking, it's more expensive. But I think if someone's developing in London, it's probably not their first time. Um, it might be. I like, like to think it is. You would hope so anyway. Um, and I think it, it's more of a landmark for your portfolio as a whole. If you can execute a really top quality development in London, that can put you in another stratosphere, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, thanks. I've never done that. Thanks. Ipswich is really <laughs> There you are, John. There's, there's your opportunity. All over the UK, but never London. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Stefano, moving on to you. I'm considering buying a property in perhaps the hills surrounding the Italian lakes. As I don't speak Italian and I'm a little worried about either making a mistake in terms of the move idea and perhaps also feeling a little isolated, I thought about renting for a while. 
what sort of tenancies are available in Italy and what sort of security would I have during the rental period? Also, what are the regulations in terms of renewal should I wish to continue renting? Ooh, my word. Um, the rules in relation to renting abroad are totally different from those that we have in England. So you have nothing like an assured short term tenancy or protection that's um, given to you like that. Um, I'd have to say that as a, a landlord, anywhere abroad, uh, you are at a dis an automatic disadvantage because the tenant is automatically granted rights of residence uh, when you have a lease uh, or a tenancy agreement of more than one month and certainly in some cases more than one year. Uh, and you can't just clip, um, let's say you want a four-year tenancy and clip it and say I'll have give you four yearly tenancies because the rights are, are acquired immediately uh, and, and you can't get out of it. Um, getting a tenant out of any jurisdiction abroad is a nightmare. I mean, I've had cases in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy especially, where it's taken five, six, seven, eight years to get people out, in Spain especially. And what's, what's the time factor there? Is it the court uh, sort of workload? Uh, not only the workload, uh, but also uh, the, the, uh, the abuse of process, uh, where mm -hmm. people uh, who are, for example, uh, the landlord, uh, the tenant, sorry, uh, don't turn up at court. Uh, they do what's called in Italy a rinvio, which is where they put it forward to the future and they say, we well, can't attend or whatever, and therefore you're forever waiting for a hearing. Uh, that's the main problem. Um, your, your rights as a tenant are very strong in Italy, France, Spain and Portugal. Uh, your rights as an owner of a property are on the, uh, on the dangerous. Uh, that's, to, that's, that's as much as I can say because they're so different in each of the, the three or four jurisdictions that we work in. Right. Okay. And what do you think to the idea that, um, that this viewer has of um, testing the water, if you like, Im by imperative. renting? Absolutely. Whether if it's your intention to be there for a long period of time, either on a sabbatical uh, or you want to re in, intend to retire there for, you know, for forever, as it were, uh, you must not buy, first of all. You must go to your chosen area, France, Italy, Spain, Spain and Portugal, and rent three, four, five months, whatever. You may even, and we've talked about this before in, in previous programmes, go to the, uh, the owner of the property and say, I'd like to rent this from you, but I'd like to have a clause in there that the rent that I pay to you will be deducted from the eventual purchase price. Um, if I intend to, if I exercise an option almost to, to buy the property within 12 months, 18 months. 80% of people who move to a particular area of a country abroad and they buy first time without knowing and move there permanently, move out within 18 months. Is that right? Yes, 80%. Because arguments between the two of them, wrong location, the children don't fit into school, uh, lack of hospitals. People don't think, when they buy a property abroad, I don't know, Tom, Tom, you think, um, if you've come across this, but people, when they buy property abroad, they seem to leave their brains at the airport and only pick them back when, uh, pick them back yeah. when, they, come, when, they, come, when they come back from holidays, as it were. Make and emotional decisions. Yeah, absolutely. They make emotional decisions. They buy with their heart and not their head. I always say to, to people, to clients, you want to instruct me, don't instruct me for the moment, go and do your due diligence, then come back to me when you know better. Some of them come to me and they say, oh, I want to buy in Spain, can you help me? Well, no. You know, it depends what you've got, where you want, your preferences and all the rest of it. So you have to do the, lo the legwork. It's no different from buying a property in the United Kingdom from John or from anywhere else. You've got to do the legwork and you've got to know what you're talking about, except that you're in a foreign jurisdiction with a different body of law and, and, and a different language. I think many people do go to live abroad and think they're going to sort of just simply... Um, import their lifestyle into the yeah, new country and it doesn't like happen. Holiday, don't they? I think that's the problem. It's like a holiday romance, isn't it? What happens in the UK, if you rent somewhere in the UK, you're back to business the next day. Yeah. You unpack yourself, you're back into work, yes. you're immediately... Yeah. When, you're in, when you buy overseas or you rent overseas, you have this period where you think, oh, I'm just going to enjoy it like a holiday for yeah, a few yeah. weeks. Oh. And when that ends, the whole dynamic changes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, what I want to ask you on this, um, Stefano is obviously... Um, very keen on Italy, and um, quite quite rightly so. It's a lovely place to live, um, but it, it's one of the European three, isn't it? France, Italy, and, and, and Spain, sort of popular destinations for either retirement or relocation. Um, and they're right, quite emotive and quite romantic sometimes in the sort of notion. Um, let's go to Dubai, which is a much more hard-headed sort of. Environment, Dubai's is it? completely different. Dubai's like the Vegas of, of the world. It's a completely different dynamic. You go to Dubai, 
for lifestyle, but it's a very opulent lifestyle. I don't like Dubai from a cultural point of view in terms of like, I go there, like, I love Italy, I love Spain, because I, I love the architecture, the art. There's a lot of like historical culture there. Mm -hmm. Dubai as a city doesn't really have that. It's very new, to, l less than 25 years old primarily. So everything is brand spanking new. So it's like being in another planet. But it's a bit heartless, isn't it? Uh, it's got no soul. That's yeah, compared to a European city, you, you could argue that, but it's a, it depends how you're going to enjoy it. There's an argument Dubai's got the best hotels in the world, some of the best restaurants, some of the best lifestyle choices. It's extremely safe. You could leave your and there's a lot car keys there's on the a beach lot and nothing will that, happen. Let's be honest. I mean, you, could, you, you put a price on that, definitely. People who go to Dubai want to enjoy carefree life yeah. within reason. Tom, let's move on to your question, which is, I, I, I suppose, loosely associated. I've looked at a number of new build properties in Dubai. All seem to be architecturally wonderful, crammed with fabulous gyms, other recreational facilities and much more. I am, however, concerned that it only seems to be newly completed or off-plan properties that are selling. Before purchasing, I need to know if there's a genuine resale market or is the new property market so strong with the usual developer incentives that second-hand property is unlikely to sell? I'll, I'll be straight up honest. There's a very weak secondary market. Um, primarily because exactly that, there's so much investment that comes from out in Dubai and the Middle East and also that's raised outside that the standard of building is just getting better and better and better. So what's a 10 out of 10 today in three years time could be a seven out of 10 because the, the technology is just increasing, increasing, the, the quality of lifestyle is increasing. So I would say if you're going to buy it in Dubai, make a long-term decision, a 10-year decision. So it's not decision. an investment. You wouldn't say it's a relatively short-term investment. I would, I would, unless you're buying off plan with the view, because say, say for example, you, you bought at a million pounds, just to make the maths easy, you bought a million pounds off plan. By phase one, the prices from the developer could have increased to say 1.2, at which point you could sell at 1.1, undercut the developer, make money, and the person buying that has got a good deal, everyone wins. But the closer it gets to that completion date, your price is gonna be reflective of what the developer could offer, yeah. and then there's no, there's no real it's secondary a, market. It's a dangerous game, isn't it? It's a, it's a big risk. I think unless you're buying in volume, you're buying 10, 15 units, then it's, yeah. uh, then, it's, then it's a great investment, but. And, and coming back to the um, earlier question that we had, would you think somebody going to Dubai to buy um, who's got these concerns about the market would again do well to rent for a while? Yep, it's expensive to rent. It's not cheap because um, there's so many great deals to buy. There's a lot of incentives to buy that renting is expensive. Um, but yeah, I think, but again, you go to a place like Dubai for purpose. You don't, you don't go just because you fancy hot weather, because who wants to have like 45 degree heat? Mm. No one. So you go there with a purpose, you're moving your business there, citizenship, residency, tax initiatives. You go there to the property that you buy will most likely save you more in tax over the long term. That It doesn't matter if it goes up in value or not. Right. That's the honest truth of what the market's like over there. Okay. And just as an investment prospect versus, say, Europe, how, how would you rate it? I would, I would rate it extremely good because if you, where you're buying off plan, you've got that scope. And even if you don't buy off plan, there are lots of things that you can do to generate income. Um, so you can buy something that generates income when you're not using it. You can use it if you need to, almost like a Pierre de Terre for like a businessman that travels internationally. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do out there to make it worthwhile. Okay, great stuff. Well, that's all we've got time for. So a big thank you to John Howard. Pleasure. Stefano Lucatello. Thank you, Z. And Tom Balashev, thank, thank you, you very much indeed. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join us again next time on Property Question Time.